All right, so are you ready for this? We're diving deep into Darwinian evolution today, and we've got this whole chapter from a biology textbook that you sent over. It's going to be dense, but I think we can break it down. I'm excited to hear what you found most interesting in all this research. Oh, there's so much good stuff in here. I think it's amazing how Darwin's theories like completely changed how we view life on Earth. Yeah, for real. It's wild to think that just a few centuries ago, like everyone thought the Earth was young and species never changed, right? It's true. It was a completely different mindset back then. Yeah, like imagine thinking life was just frozen in time. Totally. Like a still life painting instead of this ever evolving masterpiece. And back then you had thinkers like Aristotle yeah. with his um, Scala Naturae. Scala Naturae, that's the latter thing, right? Yeah, exactly. The idea that you could like rank all life forms from simple to complex. With humans at the top, of course. Yeah, actually. It was all about <laughs> hierarchy. No room for change, huh? Nope, not really. And then, boom, Linnaeus comes along categorizing everything he can get his hands on. He was obsessed with order. And his system of classification, it's the basis for how we understand relationships between organisms, even today. So even though he wasn't thinking about evolution, he kind of set the stage for it. Definitely. He created this amazing family tree, and then Darwin came along and drew all the lines. Love that analogy. But we can't forget about, like, the actual rocks, right? No. Fossils were already turning heads. Oh, for sure. Fossils were a huge deal. Think about Cuvier, a leading geologist. He saw evidence of extinctions in the fossil record. That some species just, like, disappeared. Yeah. But he thought it was all about sudden disasters, catastrophes, wiping out entire species, not slow and steady change. Ah, uh, okay. So he saw the change, but not the process. Exactly. And that's where Hutton and Lyle come in. These guys were all about gradualism. Gradualism. Remind me what that is again. It's the idea that, like, mountains erode and valleys form over super long periods of time. Those subtle shifts that, you know, shape the earth. Got it. So small changes adding up over millions of years. Right. And that was huge for Darwin because it showed that those same gradual processes could explain changes in life, too, over immense timescales. OK, so now we've got an ancient earth. We've got species going extinct. We've got gradual change. And then we get Lamarck. Ah, yes, Lamarck. He was actually on the right track in some ways. He believed that species change over time. He did. But I thought his big idea was, like, totally debunked. Well, his mechanism was wrong, but he was thinking about change, which was radical at the time. Okay, so what was his idea? Remember that whole giraffe stretching its neck thing? Oh, right, right. Yeah. So Lamarck thought those acquired traits, like the longer neck, could be passed down to offspring. Yep. It was a good try, but we know now that it doesn't quite work that way. You can't, like, give your kids bigger muscles just by working out a lot. Uh-huh, right. Genetics had to catch up. Exactly. But even though Lamarck was off in the details, his ideas were still super important. Oh, absolutely. He shifted the conversation from fixed species to, like, the possibility of change over time. And that was a big deal. So then what? Does Darwin just jump right in? Well, first, we got to take a little trip with him. Hop on board the HMS Beagle. It's 1831, and this voyage is about to change everything. Oh, yeah, the famous Beagle voyage. I remember reading about that. It was a turning point for Darwin. Picture him, you know, exploring South America, the Amazon rainforest, the Andes Mountains, all this incredible biodiversity, just soaking it all in. And finding all kinds of cool fossils. Right, yeah. tons of them. He found extinct creatures that were, like, strikingly similar to modern species in South America. Talk about a clue. Right. It really sparked his curiosity about how life transforms over time. So was that like his big aha moment? Well, that came a little later. When the Beagle landed in the Galapagos Islands, these volcanic islands were like isolated worlds, each with its own unique set of species. Oh, right. The Galapagos. That's where you saw those famous finches, right? Yeah. The Galapagos finches, each with a beak perfectly adapted to the food sources on its island. So different beaks for different foods. It's like each island had its own customized toolkit. Exactly. And while he was there, Darwin was also reading Lyell's Principles of Geology. The book about gradualism. That's the one. So he's got this idea of vast geological time, the power of gradual change, and he's seeing all this incredible diversity. It all starts to click. Wow, that's amazing. So he comes home with all these revolutionary ideas. Did he just like shout it from the rooftops? Not exactly. He actually sat on his theory for years. Seriously? 
Why? He was afraid of the controversy it would cause. I and mean, can you imagine years of research, this groundbreaking theory, and he's just sitting on it. It must have been nerve wracking. I bet. So what finally made him publish? Well, he gets this letter from Alfred Russell Wallace, another brilliant naturalist. Yeah. Wallace had independently come up with the same idea of natural selection. Oh, wow. That's crazy. Talk about a publish or perish moment. Right. So both Darwin and Wallace deserve credit for their insights. But it was Darwin's book on the origin of species that really shook things up. It was packed with research and detailed arguments that just blew people's minds. A true game changer. So let's get into the heart of his theory. Descent with modification. Mm. Sounds kind of complicated. It's actually pretty simple. Imagine life as a giant tree. Okay. The trunk represents a common ancestor way back in time, and all the branches represent the diversity of life we see today. I like that. So we're all connected, like branches on a tree. Exactly. Everything is related through shared ancestry. And to see this in action, you don't even need to dig up fossils. Just look at your own hand. Talk about it. The bones in your hand, it's the same basic structure you'd find in a bat's wing or a whale's flipper. Whoa, really? Yeah. It's like nature is using the same blueprint, but modifying it for different purposes. Yeah. These homologous structures, they're like echoes of our evolutionary past. That's so cool. So we're all just modified versions of the same basic design. Pretty much. And speaking of modifications, what about those um, leftover bits, like those tiny leg bones you find in some snakes? Oh, yeah. Those are weird. Why do they have those? They're called vestigial structures. They're remnants of fissures that were like fully functional on their ancestors. Like, imagine finding an old car with a hand crank, even though it has an electric starter. It's a reminder of how it used to be. Exactly. So we've got this sprawling tree of life, branching out, changing, adapting. But what's driving this whole process, that's where Darwin's second big idea comes in, natural selection. Okay, so natural selection is like nature's way of choosing the best adaptations, right? You got it. It's like nature is constantly editing, selecting for the traits that work best in a given environment. And that's how species change over time. But this isn't just some ancient history, right? It's happening all the time. Oh, absolutely. It's happening right now, all around us. One of the most dramatic examples is antibiotic resistance. Like when bacteria evolved to survive the drugs we use to kill them. Exactly. It's a powerful reminder that natural selection is constantly at work shaping life in response to environmental pressures, even those created by us. Wow. So we're basically part of this evolutionary arms race. Mm. But it's not just bacteria, right? Not at all. Think about the soapberry bugs. They feed on plants, and their beak length has actually evolved to match the size of the fruit they eat. It's a great example of how natural selection can lead to visible changes in just a few generations. So it's not always slow and gradual. Sometimes yeah. evolution can happen really fast. Right. And this highlights something really important. Uh, evolution isn't some distant process that happened millions of years ago. It's happening right now, all around us. It's shaping the future of life on Earth. That's mind-blowing. So we've gone from the ancient world of fixed species to Darwin's groundbreaking insights. And now we can see all this evidence for evolution happening in real time. It really changes how you view the world. It definitely does. Darwin's theory provides this amazing lens for understanding the diversity of life, but it's not just a static concept. It's constantly evolving as we learn more. So there's still more to discover. Oh yeah, this is just the beginning. Yeah, yeah it's a story that's constantly unfolding and one that we can actually observe and test in real time. It's not just about you know, fossils and anatomy, we can actually watch evolution happening. Wait, really? <laughs> like set up an experiment and see evolution happening right in front of you. Exactly. And there's this awesome study on guppies in Trinidad. They really bring this to life. So imagine these little fish, right? They live in streams and pools and they face different predators depending on where they are. Okay. Different neighborhoods, different dangers. Got it. Mm. But how does that tie into evolution? Well, male guppies, they've got these crazy color patterns, all bright spots and flashy hues. Like little underwater peacocks. Yeah. Showing off to attract mates. You got it. But all that flashiness, it makes them easy targets for predators, too. Oh, right. So it's like a trade-off. Look good for the ladies or risk becoming lunch. Exactly. It's all about survival and reproduction. So in those pools with lots of predators, you'd think the male guppies would be more, like, low-key. <laughs> Right. Blending in with the scenery instead of rocking those neon colors. Yeah, exactly. And that's what researchers found. In pools with lots of these big, scary predators called pike cichlids, the male guppies were much less colorful. Pike cichlids? 
Those sound intense. They are. They love to eat guppies. So those guppies are like, okay, got to tone it down if we want to survive around here. Exactly. But then there are other pools with a different predator, killifish, which mostly eat young guppies before they develop their full adult colors. Oh, okay. So in those pools, the male guppies can be more flashy. You got it. They can flaunt those bright colors to attract mates without being as worried about the pike cichlids. So the killifish are kind of like accidentally helping those flashy guppies. It's like they're playing matchmaker. And researchers took this even further. They took those drab guppies from the high predation pools and put them in a low predation pool. Oh, so like they're giving those guppies a makeover. Did it work? Did they get more colorful? They did. Over a few generations, those transplanted guppies evolved to be more colorful, larger, brighter spots. It shows how fast natural selection can work when the environment changes. That's amazing. Yeah. They went from wallflowers to the life of the party, evolutionarily speaking. It's like a real-life makeover story. Yeah. But those guppies are just one example, right? What about the bigger picture? Like, how do we explain the shared characteristics that connect all life forms? I mean, we're obviously not the same as bacteria, but we share some fundamental similarities. Right. It's this amazing paradox, unity and diversity, and evolution explains it beautifully. At the most basic level, all life on Earth uses the same language, DNA. So, like, we all have the same instruction manual, yeah. but with different chapters and variations. Exactly. From the simplest bacteria to us complex humans, it's all based on DNA. And we don't just share this genetic language, we also share a bunch of the same genes, even with organisms that seem completely different. So even though bacterium and humans seem, well, totally different, we still have some common ground. We do. And that's the coolest part. It points to our shared evolutionary history. Some of those genes have been modified over billions of years to do different things, while others have basically stayed the same, doing the same essential tasks across all life forms. It's like looking at old family photos and seeing those same features passed down through generations. Except in this case, it's a photo album that's billions of years old. I love that. And it's this amazing combination of shared heritage and unique adaptations that makes life so fascinating. A story written in the language of genes, sculpted by natural selection. It's constantly being revised as life finds new ways to thrive. So we've come a long way in this deep dive. From the ancient world of fixed species to Darwin's revolutionary ideas to modern examples of evolution in action. It really changes how you see the world, doesn't it? Absolutely. Darwin's work wasn't just about explaining change over time. It was about recognizing the fundamental unity of all life. It's a legacy that's still inspiring us today as we keep exploring the mysteries of the natural world. And it reminds us that we're not just observers of this evolutionary process. We're active participants. We're shaping the future of life on Earth. That's a huge responsibility. And it means understanding and protecting the incredible diversity that evolution has created. It's our job to make sure that this amazing story keeps unfolding. Yeah, it's humbling, right? Billions of years in the making, all this diversity is pretty incredible. And it's still happening. It's like when you really dig into the molecular stuff, the mechanisms behind evolution, that's when it gets even more mind-blowing. So we've covered a lot of ground here, but for someone who's just starting to learn about evolution, what's the big takeaway? Why does Darwin still matter today? Well, evolution isn't just some abstract idea. It's like the foundation of all biology. It helps us understand everything from the diversity of life to the relationships between species to how diseases work. So it's not just about dinosaurs and fossils. It actually has real world applications. Oh, totally. Think about it understanding how bacteria evolve to resist antibiotics. That helps us fight drug resistant infections. And knowing how pests evolve to resist pesticides, that helps us develop better ways to control them. So we're using evolutionary principles to solve real problems. Exactly. And it's becoming even more important as we face things like climate change and habitat loss. If we understand how species adapt, we can help protect them and the ecosystems we all depend on. Right. That makes sense. But let's be real. Some people still struggle with the idea of evolution. They might see it as just a theory or something that contradicts their beliefs. How do we address that? I think it comes down to understanding what a scientific theory really means. It's not just a guess, right? It's an explanation that's backed up by tons of evidence from different fields. So it's like saying gravity is just a theory. Exactly. We don't see people jumping off buildings because they don't believe in gravity. Evolution is the same. It's the best explanation we have for how life on Earth works. And it's supported by evidence from fossils, from genetics, from anatomy, from all sorts of places. It's like this huge puzzle and all the pieces fit together. Right. 
And the more we learn, the more pieces we find, and the clearer the picture becomes. But evolution is not just about competition and survival of the fittest, right? There's also cooperation between species. Oh, yeah, absolutely. It's not always a fight. Evolution has also produced some incredible examples of um, cooperation and symbiosis. Like, think about flowering plants and pollinators. Those are pretty amazing relationships. They need each other to survive. Exactly. It shows how interconnected everything is. And that's why conservation is so important. Losing one species can have a huge impact on a whole ecosystem. It's like pulling a thread from a tapestry. The whole thing can unravel. So as we wrap up this deep dive into Darwin, what's the one thing you want our listeners to take away? I think just a sense of wonder, you know, appreciation for how amazing life is and how much diversity there is. From tiny microbes to giant whales, it's all part of the same story, this grand interconnected web of life. It really is a mind-blowing story, and it's not over yet, right? Not even close. There's still so much to learn, so many mysteries to unravel. So keep exploring, keep asking questions, and keep being amazed by the power of evolution.